I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Hannah Elliott, and this is Hot Pursuit. And we have a special interview for you today because one of the most iconic races in, I was going to say motorsports, but I think in races yeah, is sporting coming events. up this weekend. Yeah, yeah, Indy 500. It's a really big deal. Have you been to the track? No. I it seems iconic. Have not been for the for the Indy 500. I've been uh, MotoGP used to race there. Oh, that's very cool. So I've gone to a MotoGP race there, um, and what a cool town for sporting events. I went to a Super Bowl there as well at the oh, Lucas Oil Stadium. Fun. I brought my mom to see Jane's Addiction uh, in Indianapolis oh, that's once. Nice. It was pretty wow, cool. Cool mom. Yeah. So <laughs> how were they? Uh, very good and like weird as you would yeah. expect them nice. to be. Um, in any case, uh, love Indy and like the history of uh, the motorsports there is amazing. You know, Purdue is, I don't know if it's the only university, but it was definitely the first university to have a motorsports engineering degree. Oh, I had no idea. So if you're uh, into sports like NASCAR, IndyCar, F1, you can go to Purdue and major in motorsports engineering. That's super cool. And it's also odd that more places don't have that. That seems like a great career path. I wish I had chosen it. Although yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty happy with this. Well, maybe well. your daughters. You can yeah, live through them. exactly. I'll definitely send. I do live through them, and I'm going to send them. <laughs> so we're going to talk to Catherine Leg about uh, her amazing qualifying session. I guess heart stopping, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, she's got real guts. I mean, earlier this week, she had a real. She had a moment. She yeah. proved her metal. Yeah, and uh, she was going fast. Like yeah, 230 no. miles right. an hour or something. I saw that. Crazy. Um, insane. So she uh, kissed the wall, as they say, but it uh, put out a plume of smoke. And uh, if you were watching, it kind of made you pause for a second. If she's driving, I would think she would pause too, but she didn't. Yeah. And you know what I liked about Catherine? She's pretty open about some of her mixed feelings about some of these women only racing series you know, that feed into Indy and feed into Formula One. I thought it was really interesting to hear her take. All right. Well, let's get into it with Catherine Legg. Let's start it off with uh, a phrase I love to use, never lift, which is part of, uh, you know, muscle car campaign. But you hit the wall in a qualifying lap and had no fear at all. How do you train for something like that? I think it's it's honestly years of muscle memory. I have a a similar kind of thing that we say we use it for driving but we also use it for skiing which is don't be a lifter right <laughs> which is kind of the same way of saying the same thing but you know subconsciously you've got four laps to make this happen and get the car in the show and so you know if you lift it's not going to happen for you and so you can't I knew, I knew it was just going to be a glancing blow I knew I wasn't going like to crash into the wall or anything it was just going to just going to touch a little bit. So I kept my foot in it. And I think that's a subconscious decision that's based upon years and years of uh, experience. Catherine, I thought it was really interesting. And I guess this is jumping into like a deep conversation right at the front. But I read some quotes where you did say, oh, actually, it was terrifying when that happened. And I'm just curious, you know, you seem very open about saying, yeah, I was scared. It was a scary moment. <laughs> Um, in a way that I don't hear from other drivers. And I, I just wonder if that is like a conscious thing about you that you are really open about the emotions you feel in the cockpit or um, is, it, is that just more subconscious? No, I am. And I don't think it's conscious, but I think it's with age and wisdom, right? Like when I was coming up through the ranks and I wanted to make it as a race car driver, I was very robotic and I would not show any kind of emotion because that was weakness. Like you had mm -hmm. to just be a robot in the car. But honestly, I think it makes you more relatable to people. Like I'm a human, I have these feelings. And so that's why I said on the on the broadcast, I'm like, do you want the big bad driver answer? Which is no, I'm fine, I'm focused, yada, yada, yada. Or do you want the honest answer, which is I am denying all of these feelings at the moment, but they are there and they're gonna bubble up. And it's, um, you know, it's a lot. There's nothing like the Indianapolis 500 when it comes to going through every single emotion. Like 
you are happy, you're sad, you're scared, you're um, angry, you're like, literally, you could go through a list of all the emotions, right? And I'd be like, yep, yep, got that one too. <laughs> so for us, the Indy 500 is huge. I mean, as Americans, right? I'm from Ohio. And people would get in their campers and go to Indy for the race. And it was like a huge ordeal. Um, is it as well known internationally, you're clearly from England. So um, is it as big a deal for you? What was the accent that gave it away or? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm half half now. I've lived most of my life in uh, America. I, I love it here. I class myself as mostly American, although I'd never deny my English roots. But yes, it is a big deal globally. It's one of the races that's on every race car driver's bucket list i mean you've got the indy 500 you've got Le Mans, you've got monaco grand prix i think we had a bunch of english drivers come over like nigel mansell who came over and made it really famous back in england so it definitely was on the radar um and i'm just very fortunate that elf have given me the opportunity to to go for it for the fourth time and hopefully um you know we'll continue to do it until I'm old and wrinkly and can't drive anymore. <laughs> can you can you talk to us this week about what your week is looking like going into the race, both how you're preparing physically, well, obviously we want to know what you're eating, what what types of stretching and and physical activity you're doing and then also, you know, uh, mentally and emotionally, um what does an indie driver do to prepare for such a massive race? I was having that conversation this morning, actually. Um, and I was saying, okay, I need to get to the gym. I need to go run. I need to do something because this last week has been so nuts that I have found myself not eating properly and um, haven't had the chance to to work out. So today we're in New York doing media. Tomorrow we will head back to the track and I'm definitely going to get a workout in. We're going to sit with the engineers, decide what we need to do for um, making the car as fast as possible in in race trim, which is what we call it, um, with more downforce on. Um, And then we have a bunch of like community day stuff that we have to do at the track for kids and schools and sponsors. And um, obviously Friday is the um, carb day, which um, what does that look like and taste like for you? Mm -hmm. So we start at like eight o'clock in the morning doing some sponsor activation. We have a driver's meeting, I believe on Friday. I don't I don't really know. I just know that my day is filled up and I look at my calendar when I finish something and move on to the next thing. Um, but carb day is basically the last chance for us on track to tune everything in ready for ready for the Sunday. So, you know, the guys are at the track right now polishing on everything, making sure everything's within millimeter tolerances. And and then we get to go and, and run around on Friday as a like warm up for the race, if you like. I, so, I, I thought you said carb day. Me like, too, like, like bread. Spaghetti carbonara yeah. kind of thing. What, what do you oh, eat? What do you like yeah. carbo loading? <laughs> no, carb is in carburetta because the old ages <laughs> had carburettas and so they used to tune the carburettas. But I like your idea better. Maybe maybe I should make Friday carb day. Um, <laughs> we typically, I like to do small meals and often and the team cater for us. So we, we normally get pretty, pretty healthy stuff, although it can be too easy when you're running in and out of the car just to have like a bunch of protein bars and fruit. And obviously that's less than ideal. So you have to be very conscious of eating all the right things. Has the way that you prepared changed over the years as as you've gotten older? I know your uh, experience, this is your fourth indie. Has that changed as you've just become wiser and more experienced? Yeah, I think so. But also older as well, right? So you have to... (laughs) You have to look at things a little bit more closely, like the way I train and the upper body and the core strength that I have. And I can't eat the uh, the sheer amount of carbs and stuff that <laughs> no, I used to. <laughs> no. Um, I wish I could. I'm really good at I'm really good at that. <laughs> but yeah, it changes and you're surrounded with people who kind of point you in the right direction and, and alter things a little bit. And so it's a work in progress. Just like with anybody, you learn what you need, what works for your body. And you, you know, 
make adjustments and and hopefully you get closer closer and closer to perfection but i'm also human right like i also drink too much coffee and <laughs> how do you and, take your uh, coffee oh it depends on the day it's like music oh with me i oh wow yeah sometimes i'm like oh chai latte sometimes i'm most of the time i'm just black like my cold heart <laughs> what about <laughs> now music? we got what the about, racer what, while we're off cars for just one second we'll get right back i, I promise our listeners but music is there a psych up song yeah. is there a genre that you get a uh, playlist that you have what do you what do you get into i <laughs> i'm super cheesy i like mostly like 90s or 2000s um like old school sing-along kind of everybody knows it songs i am not trendy in that way in any way shape or form we need I some names we need some titles get specific with us here. i'm feeling robbie williams here i was listening to <laughs> nirvana's album the other day and i was like this brings me back <laughs> that's cool that's classic that's not cheesy all right so what did get you started back in i guess it must have been what, the late 80s, early 90s that you started driving racing? Yeah, I was nine years old and it was like 1990 and uh, I started racing go-karts. And um, I did that with my dad. I'm still very close to my dad. My dad comes to all the races. Um, he was super stressed on, on bump day as well. Um, I have raced go-karts for 10 years and then I got scholarship to move into open wheel and then I actually made my transition to North America, which is when I started driving professionally uh, at Long Beach in 2005 in like an Indy Lights type car where I won the race. And that's actually what put me on the map. And that's the reason that I am talking to you guys today. I'm curious, you know, did your dad see something that he knew this girl has some talent? I mean, what did he see that you had that other little kids didn't have? Was he at the track? I mean, how did he even get yeah. the idea? So we went on a family holiday vacation to Spain and my dad and my uncle had to go on the fun carts there. And I wasn't tall enough. <laughs> you know, there's like that height requirement. And um, they enjoyed it. So they looked at where you could do it back in England. And um, I was always a little bit of an adventure, adrenaline junkie, tomboy, whatever you whatever you want to call it. And so I, I was also daddy's little girl and I went with my dad to the local go-kart track and I nagged him and I nagged him and he was driving for, I don't know, maybe three to six months at that time. And he loved it because he's super competitive. He played somewhat competitive football, soccer. Um, and so uh, I nagged him and nagged him. He bought me a go-kart for my uh, Christmas present that year, actually. And we did a couple of races together and he decided that there was more of a future and he got just as much out of watching me. Um, uh -huh. So he kind of focused all the effort on me. And I think he's kind of lived vicariously, you know, like he may not have been able to do it because he was already older and had kids and on all that kind of stuff. But like we've done it together. So it's as mm -hmm. much as his success as mine. Wow. So is that does that feel like pressure to you, you know, Sounds like, um, you know, some kids, they, they're, it's really, you're right. They're living for their parents' dreams, really. That's completely uh, my plan, 100%. I have a three-year-old three daughter and uh, a, a zero-year-old daughter, and I'm going to live vicariously through them. <laughs> is that, is that, that must be pressure. Is that good pressure or bad pressure or both? It's not, it's not pressure, really. Um, I, I don't think I've ever seen it as pressure. I've always rebelled. <laughs> And, um, you know, I've never thought of it like that, but I do the best job that I can do. And my dad's proud oh. of me regardless. Right. Oh. He just enjoys being there. He comes to all my races, you know, he, he's learned over the years, like when to ask me questions about it and when not to, in case I <laughs> snap at him or something, you know, because like, not right now, dad, he's like, what are you doing with the car? And I'm like, not right now. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so it's a unique relationship that you have with. Like you would never shower your engineer, right? Like your engineer would say, okay, what's going on with the car? And you'd be like, well, I'm just here coming out of turn two and power down here is a bit difficult and blah, blah, blah. When your dad asks you, you're like, why do you need to know? <laughs> what about other cars? Did you ever get into other cars or was it just race cars for you? 
I'm not that big of a car person. Um, I don't know the different noise that all of the supercars make. And I, I mean, I could tell you what they are and I know a certain amount about them, but I'm not super into cars. I'm super into competition. Don't get me wrong. I love cars, but it's, it's the sport more than the machine itself. A lot of times for me, um, I always wanted to be a formula one driver or IndyCar driver. Um, I, didn't grow up wanting to own a Ferrari, right? Like mm -hmm. I wanted to do the sport rather than than have the car. And um, I can appreciate them and I love them, don't get me wrong, but it was never about the car. I'm really curious, Catherine, you mentioned Formula One and I know you've actually, uh, I think you were the first woman to do a Formula One car test in modern times. Is that, am I getting that right? I think, no, Sarah Fisher. So there's been so few of us, right? It's yeah. easy for me to remember. So uh -huh. back when when women weren't even allowed in the pits and there was no female toilets or anything like that, there was Janet Guthrie and she started it all off. Okay. And then came Vincent James. Um, both of them did IndyCar and NASCAR races. And then after them came Sarah Fisher and Danica Patrick. And um, then me. And okay. so for the most part, the ones that have been taken seriously. Now there are, there's a championship for girls that follows sure. from the one academy. Um, and there are so many opportunities for young girls coming up through our sport. Like I often joke, I wish I was like 10, 20 years younger. <laughs> and I was just coming up now because the landscape has totally changed. Like it's it went from zero to like almost you you want to be a 18 year old girl coming into racing because the world is your oyster and so there were so few of us we all kind of we sarah drove i think for mclaren um at a test at a grand prix one time and then i drove for minardi and actually we were talking about racing for minardi but they sold out to red bull so my mm -hmm. f1 dream kind of got sold with it but um i have been I have been the first to do a lot of things just by nature of being the only one, right? Mm. Can you give us a sense of how a Formula One car is different to drive than an Indy car? The premise is basically the same, right? Um, the F1 cars are basically new every year. They're developed so highly and there's so much money spent on them. Um, IndyCar have basically capped the budgets that are needed by by ensuring that it's the same car every year. And so the development of the IndyCar has been a lot slower than the development of the F1 car because they wanted to keep it something that fans could relate to, right? Mm. You've got all the things that, I don't know that is it's not super electronically advanced however they're going in that direction next year with hybrid um but it's basically like you've got springs and bars and things that you can do with the car whereas the the f1 car has so many different knobs and whistles and so many driver aids and so much mm -hmm. electronics and development going on in it that it is a finely tuned engineering masterpiece whereas the indy car is raw mm -hmm. and powerful and um you know, like American muscle car more than <laughs> more than uh, Italian stallion. So, I mean, you mentioned Nigel Mansell, and if I think about even older drivers, Lauda or uh, Jackie Stewart, back then they didn't have um, so much assist in steering. It was much more physical, I would imagine. Um, I guess it's still incredibly physical now because you see all all the F one. Uh, and IndyCar drivers are in amazing shape and working out all the time. But will there be more women drivers as um, the car is easier to control? Or do you think that's not a differentiating factor? Um, I have mixed feelings on this. And I only have mixed feelings on this lately. So when I was driving Champ Car, those things were big and brutal and fought you. And I was in the gym at least twice a day, sometimes three times a day. And wow. I was just very strong right because you wow. had to be luckily it's not outright strength it's repetitive strength and women are proven to be better equipped at taking g-force than guys so i worked really really hard to be strong enough to drive these cars and these cars are still really physical to drive um 
I know a lot of women that struggle with that, but they've actually changed. That is one concern that they they're having at the moment is the the strength aspect, and they're actually changing for a series. I think it's F four, but I can't remember. In Europe, they're giving them a different uh, front setup, basically, for the girls to be able to drive it. And they're considering doing um, power steering so that the girls can drive it and the girls can be competitive. And my mixed feelings come from I had to work really hard <laughs> to be strong enough to do this and do what the guys do. And we've been banging on about equality for so long now. Like, make make them go to the gym and work out. Make them get strong enough because if I can do it, they can do it. And I don't want any handouts. I don't want to be given special treatment because I'm a woman. I want to prove that I can do it off my own back, right? So yes, they're extremely physical, but it is nothing that we can't handle. And I think back in the day when I was doing Champ Car, which is today's IndyCar basically, um, there was a lot of questions as to whether we were strong enough to drive the car and I had to put those to rest. And then we didn't hear, hear about it for a long time, but the next generation of young girls while they're really wiry and light, which is great for being competitive because the lighter you are, the more you can move the weight around in the car. Um, sure. They they need to eat a sandwich and go bulk up. Sorry, it doesn't look attractive or however you think it, but it is what it is. And if you want to win, that's what you've got to do. So what do you think then about F1 Academy? I was I've been just going to ask that. I've been having this debate in my house for years because we watch MotoGP religiously. And I've always said, I wish there was a female only version. And my wife is like, <laughs> Women should be able to race with the boys, you know, no problem. Um, I also have mixed feelings about that. So on one hand, I think, yeah, great. It would bring more women into it and girl power. And I'm all for it um, with the with the power steering and everything. And the same thing with the female academy, the W series, whatever it's called. I think great that it's giving these girls an opportunity that they wouldn't have necessarily got on their own, but they're going to have to go and race against the best of the best so is that just pushing that further down the line are they really learning anything okay they get um exposed to formula one teams which is great to have those connections um but until they are translating that into wins in formula three and a formula two and everything else then all they're doing is not improving at the level they would have improved if they're thrown in at the deep end because if you are competing against the best it makes you up your game it does you're learning from your teammates who are better than you um it doesn't mean anything to be the best girl i think that Ooh, is very interesting you got to be the best driver like some of them maybe want to be the best girl and that's fine if that's what they want to do i'm not knocking that but for me i wanted to be the best race car driver because i believe in myself and i know that i can compete against the boys and i kind of want them to feel the same way but i know not everybody is the same and so on one hand, I'm like, yay, they're getting opportunities and it's getting us exposure and this is going to develop them into the race car drivers of the future. But on the other hand, I feel like it's handicapping them as well. And I feel like those sponsors and those opportunities should be in car in good cars because traditionally that's our problem, right? We haven't been given the best of equipment and it should be in good cars against the best and like put their feet to the fire and let's see what they're made of because the harder it is, the harder you work to get there. Does that mean that you think that women only racing series like F1 Academy ultimately will not put women drivers in Formula One and in, in IndyCar? I think they will if they're good enough. I think, look at Jamie Chadwick as an example, okay? Mm -hmm. Jamie won everything w series wise and looked super strong but when she went into other series she was at the back of tail of the, the pack mm -hmm. and last year she struggled in indie lights then she realized what she needed to do uh which was go to the gym and get much stronger and i've spoken to mm -hmm. her about this and um she's become really competitive this year she's racing against the best she's learning from the best with the teams and she's up in the top five like pretty much every session so i don't know if that had happened for her three or four years ago like would she be in indycar by now uh, because she's done it that way she's probably likely going to make it to indycar right so mm -hmm. it's just delayed the process in my mind but if that's what she had to do to get there to get the backing to get there and everything else and that's what she had to do so 
I, that's why, that's where the mixed feelings come in, I guess. Like, is it a necessary evil or um, mm. not? How about this? When you go to the go-kart track, um, do you see more girls out there? Because I think the idea is you want to get more in the pipeline, right? Just boost the number in of general. young girls who want to be race car drivers. And then in the future, you won't need uh, a separate series. A hundred percent. It's a numbers game. If you think of it like a pyramid, you've got at the bottom of the pyramid in go-karts and the lower formula, you've got thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of young boys who want to be the next IndyCar, NASCAR or Formula One driver. Whereas you've only got a handful of girls at the moment who, who want the same thing and are willing to suffer through everything to get there. If we get more girls interested in racing and thinking of it as a prospect in grassroots level, then they will trickle up and they will trickle through. I mean, there's only a handful of drivers that ever make it to be super professional paid drivers. I mean, you've got a handful of IndyCar, Formula One and and some sports car drivers, NASCAR as well, obviously. But if you think about all the boys trying to do it, it's it's immense. So we just need to get those girls to see it, to believe it, and and work up and through. All right, I want to get back to talk about what's going on this weekend. What needs to happen for you to get better pace and to finish on the podium? Or are you aiming for a, a certain place in the midfield? What, what do you think about this weekend? I uh, qualified 31st. It was very traumatic <laughs> uh, bump day qualifying. Um, we need we need speed. We don't know what the the lack of speed is not coming from. Obviously, if you watched my qualifying run last week, you would have seen the car was uh, was pretty snappy, and I had to stay in the the gas through it all, which was one of the most nerve wracking experiences I think I've I've ever been through. But um, we're just trying to find a good balance and some speed. You know, um, Honda are working hard behind the scenes to to find us some more power. And we are kind of on our wing and a prayer going into this weekend, hoping that we can just kind of be competitive. At the moment, we don't know what that looks like, but I know that I will be proud of myself no matter where I finish, as long as I get out of the car and think that nobody else could have driven that car better than I did, right? Like that's as fast as that car will go on the day. We've got a bunch of really cool uh, elf things that they're doing over the weekend. We've got a drone show that's basically 500 drones. That's just to empower women. And it's a big display about me and about uh, the Indy 500, who they've partnered with to do really cool Roblox um, game integrations. And they're going to do lip oil changes and sweepstakes. And, and it's going to be... Like it's a big deal for the whole women in racing movement because it's the first time that women have felt represented. And while I thought, oh, it's a pink car, that's super cliche. Hmm. I did not realize how much it's meant to so many people. And I've got so many young girls and women and even guys coming up to me and saying, you know, for the first time they recognize that we're here and it's not just a bunch of men. And I love Elf's products and I'm gonna go buy Elf because they're sponsoring you for this. And I honestly had no idea it'd be as, as huge as it's been and it's and it's really cool. So aside from the race, that's something else that I'm super proud of and I'm hoping we can build on and carry this movement into the future. Well, Catherine, thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us. We're definitely rooting for you this weekend. Um, and 100%. And yeah, I, I love your mentality about it. It's just, it's so admirable. So thank you for taking the time to chat. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate you both. That is um, a very cool point she made at the end because, you know, like I said, my wife hates when gear for women is pink. Like I, yeah. If we're going skiing or like I when know. she's buying motorcycle leathers, they I have know. a pink. It annoys her. Having said that, my daughter, who's three and a half, mm -hmm. regardless of the cliche of it, loves pink. It's I her favorite that. color. So I hear when that she's about watching, yeah, when she's watching, she's going to be like, I want the girl in pink to win. Yeah, Even when we're odd. watching MotoGP, she likes if, you know, Alessia Spargo wears pink or Jorge Martin has like purple on his bike. She wants them to win because she likes the colors. And I, I like that. Yeah. That's sweet. What have you got coming up? I know you just put out a Ferrari review, which yes, listeners can read on the Bloomberg Terminal, on Bloomberg.com. Yes. But yeah, the Ferrari 296 GTS, which is the spider version of the GTB, um, 
I I loved it, but I did have some quibbles as well. So you can read about that on the terminal or on online or on my social media. Wait, what's the biggest quibble? The uh, the infotainment controls yeah. that is like a postage stamp haptic screen on the steering wheel that you're supposed to like maneuver with your thumb while you're driving. This is it's stupid. just completely crazy. Someone needs to go back <laughs> to analog, really. I, yeah, but other than that, a uh, kind of a fabulous car. And how could it not be? Yeah, I mean, I've heard that it's like one of the greats, and I think it that was is, your conclusion as well. And it's, and I say that also knowing that it's a V6 hybrid, which some people may say doesn't even deserve the name Ferrari on it. Of course, because let's remember the the well, six cylinder. Yeah, the six cylinder. Uh, Dino Ferrari actually wouldn't even acknowledge as a Ferrari, even though they made it. They yeah. it was like they wouldn't acknowledge <laughs> acknowledge it. So um, technically, this actually is the first six cylinder Ferrari that Ferrari has sold under the name. Ferrari. I'm skeptical of <laughs> it just because I feel like a Ferrari should be a V12, the sort of famous motor that Enzo uh, loved from the Packards. Or mm -hmm. a screaming flat plane crank V8, um, but yeah. I'm willing to change my opinion. And if I ever get to drive that car, <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to absolutely love it. Yeah. So I believe it. I believe it. But definitely check out uh, Hannah's um, write up of that on the Bloomberg. And then anything else? Yeah. You got something fun you in your what? driveway? I, or I'm getting on it. Well, I'm getting on a plane this afternoon. I'm going to go to Italy and try to take a few days off. But I will also be at Villa d'Este. Um, this weekend, I won't be at the Monaco Grand Prix, even though I will be kind of within shooting distance. And I really wish I wish I would have planned better because maybe I would have made that happen. But um, I will be at the Villa d'Este Concorde d'Elegance, which is that old classic car, basically beauty contest that BMW has sponsored for two decades on Lake Como. It's really, really nice. You would love it, Matt. I'll send you pictures. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I love that area. And yes. it's a great place to drive, to ride motorcycles, to vacation, um, little wooden speedboats, go visit oh, George yeah. Clooney. Like right. there's so much to do around there. I am, I'm hoping that I'm going to get a crack at the new Mustang Dark Horse in the next week. Now, we, what makes you think, have you been in contact with them? Yes. I've, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've been talking to Okay. Uh, people at Ford and I've been waiting. I haven't driven Ooh. this new generation, but I've watched like, I've watched like two hours of straight pipes reviews. <sighs> and I mean, to me, the car looks amazing. I loved the last generation. Uh, I've been a Mustang fan for since, you know, since I was a little Have boy. Have you ever owned a Mustang? I've never personally owned a Mustang. My dad uh, okay. had a 64 and a half Mustang. So he had the original, the OG 289. But I really wanted to get one um, recently, uh, and I'm still looking around, bring a trailer, especially the GT350 from the last generation. But the Dark Horse may may seal the deal. Now, I mean, does the Dark Horse add power, or is it just cosmetic upgrades? It adds a little bit of power. Um, I think 14 horsepower and no torque. So it, it doesn't really matter <laughs> okay. that much. All right. The cosmetic upgrades... If I had my druthers, I would reverse because I want to get rid of the splitter and the yes. and the tail. Because you're an that. adult. Yes, exactly. You're I like over the, the age of sixteen. I like the EcoBoost <laughs> design, right? Uh huh. Um, and but the most important thing about the Dark Horse, uh, other than the fact that I think it might come with the Magna Ride suspension standard, or you have to option that with the GT. I'm not sure. But the most important thing is it comes with the Manual. Tremec. Yeah. Oh. Well, you can get the GT with a manual. Okay. Um, it's an MT82, but you what you want is the Tremec. Like n nobody liked the manual transmission that's in the Mustang GT in the last generation, and the only reason I think that they continue to use that, I've asked Ford engineers about this, is that they want you to pay more to get the dark horse instead. Of so course. it's like the Mach One had this amazing Tremec, and the GT350 had this Tremec in it. Um, although I don't think it had rev matching on downshifts, which I need because I can't heel and toe. But <laughs> that's why you pay the extra money is for the uh, for the transmission. Okay, well this is good to know.
All right, I guess I that's... I hope you get it. I, I hope you I, get I, it. I hope so, too. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's all we have to talk about this week. Join us again, same time, same place next week. If you have any thoughts on the women in racing debate, uh, you know, whether they should have their own series or whether they should just go with the, the pack. Feel free. Okay. I'll brace myself for the onslaught at hotpursuit at bloomberg.net. If you have any thoughts on... Uh, the Ferrari, a V6 hybrid in the Ferrari. We already talked about it last time, but I still would love yeah. to hear people's thoughts. Um, and or the Mustang. Hot Pursuit yeah. at Bloomberg.net. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Hannah Elliott. And this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.